Wrenching headlights is a skill that custom car builders and metal fabricators have been honing for decades. It's the art of recessing the headlights of a car into the fenders, removing the need for the original chrome bezel or trim ring. It might sound simple, but forming all new sheet metal in a way that blends flawlessly into the factory curves and lines is no easy task. It takes years of practice and thousands of hours to perfect. Or does it? We're jumping into the process of Frenching the headlights on this heavily chopped and modified 1949 Mercury. Just about every inch of sheet metal has been touched on this traditional custom, and all the modifications were done by hand. The to-do list is almost crossed off entirely, aside from Frenching the headlights. For years, the easy solution to Frenching headlights was to buy a set of preformed rings from a company like Shoebox Central and weld them in. But for one reason or another, they're no longer available. So it's back to shaping them by hand, like the good old days. Assigned to tackle this task is Phil. You might have seen his work in other videos on our channel, like the air harvester and the scratch-built radiator fan shroud he built. During the process, Phil will be using a wide variety of specialty hammers and dollies to help him achieve the shapes he needs. The different radiuses and shapes are used to match whatever he's trying to make. Step one was to remove the headlight clips and flip them around. In this case, he welded nuts to the front fenders so the headlights can be bolted in from the inside the fenders. This also lets us install the headlights flush or use a simple spacer to recess the headlights back into the fender. Then before getting to Frenching, Phil made a set of rings that serve as the inner structure of the headlights and help center them in the fenders. These rings are generally referred to as the inner channels. Phil got to practice a little bit by roughing in the shape of the passenger side headlights, but now it was time to move on to the driver side. To give himself something to work with, Phil cut a ring out of 18 gauge sheet metal. In the process of forming the metal, the dimensions will grow and shrink in certain areas. So he made the inside and outside diameters of the ring larger than he needs. He'll be able to trim it down to the perfect size as he goes along. A deburring tool and a belt sander help Phil smooth out the inner and outer edges of his pattern before he starts to form it. Then he takes time to scribe a center line into the ring, along with some reference marks at 12, 3, 6, and 9. Using the shrinker, he works the outside edge of the ring and starts forming a crown. Next, he moves on to the planishing hammer and selects a set of dies he thinks will fit the new curve of the metal best. The planishing hammer is mostly used to smooth out imperfections left after using other tools to form the metal. but a lot of the times the planishing hammer can work against you since it has the effect of stretching the metal. So Phil would work to shrink the edges of the ring to get the radius he wanted, but then the planishing hammer would stretch it out a little too much and take the shape back out of it. To really get some of the shape back into the ring, Phil opted for a little hammer forming. It might not be pretty at first, but it's a quick way to achieve a rough shape.
Then it was back to the planishing hammer, but this time he needed to pick a die with more crown to match the new shape of the metal. These dies all have standardized numbers, making a selection process a little easier. Now Phil just lets the machine work to remove all the highs and lows in the metal. Since the upper die is flat, only the highest point on the lower die is actually making contact with the material. No force is needed on Phil's part. His job is to intentionally move the piece around on the dies to give the planishing hammer time to smooth out every inch. The machine does have adjustability in terms of how much pressure it exerts, but Phil likes to keep it as light as possible to avoid overworking the material he's forming. Once he's achieved the shape he was aiming for, he checks to see how it's lining up with the curves in the fender. Clearly, he needs a lot more curve in this piece, but that's just how the process works. You gotta start somewhere. Phil makes some reference marks to help him shape the right parts of the ring. Then it's back to forming the metal. He went ahead and cut down the ring into a section that fit best and focused on that. Then it's just hours of back and forth, tool by tool, piece by piece, until the shapes are just right. Enjoying the video? Consider subscribing and check out some of our other videos. If you're new to Old Anvil TV, this channel offers a unique look into the world of building custom, high-end classic cars and trucks. We'll show everything from designing and fabricating a custom chassis all the way through to the finished build. Once the shape is close to what he's trying to accomplish, Phil can start to trim it down to size. He uses metal shears to trim off a larger amount of material, then he can fine tune the edge using the disc sander. The red marker works like the purple dicum you may have seen the guys use in other videos. It helps provide more contrast when scribing a cut or trim line on a piece of metal.
After fine tuning the edge, he smooths it out using a rawhide hammer over a radius dolly. Phil takes time to feel out the driver's side to make sure he's replicating it on the passenger side. With the outside edge dialed in, he moves on to the inner edge. On the shrinker stretcher, he installs the stretcher dies and works to pull the inner edge down to tighten the gap between it and the inner headlight barrel. Then he uses a bead roller to put a matching tank roll on the inner edge. After the first piece was shaped, Phil tacked it in place and moved on to the next one. After a couple hours, he had the top half of the new ring in place. And somewhere in that time lapse, he even found time to correct a small mistake. He didn't realize it, but a tack on one side of the headlight ring broke while he was tacking in the other side, causing it to pull and distort. Some expletives may have been used, but since it happened during the time lapse, we'll never know. The lower half was next. Phil picked the section of material that fit best and cut it down to work in a smaller piece. To keep everything cohesive, Phil originally drew a 9 inch radius around the fender. This would become helpful when working on the lower section. The top half he wanted to blend in with the natural curve of the fender, but on the bottom the new ring butts up against the flat portion of the fender. So on the lower half, he shapes the material so that it blends from the more distinct crown of the top ring down to a more flat shape on the lower half. That 9 inch radius he marked on the fender tells Phil exactly where his material should meet up with the fender.
The hardest part is making it look natural from every angle. That's why you can see Phil constantly looking at the fender from different perspectives. According to Phil, your tape measure might say one thing, but at the end of the day, your eye has the final say. As Phil TIG welds the inner edge, he gives a few taps of the body hammer where needed to close up the seam. He keeps working his way around the headlight, trimming and fitting each piece. If you've noticed, Bill's welding weapon of choice has been a TIG gun, but on parts of the lower edge he'll be using a MIG instead. There are two reasons for that. First, on the top and inner edges of the headlight surround, he had access to hammer out his welds. This is a crucial step when using a TIG welder to butt weld two pieces of metal together. On the outside edge of the bottom half, it became much more difficult to hammer out those welds. Then, a second reason was that Phil wanted to add a small radius where his new headlight ring meets the fender on the lower inside edge. To accomplish this, he uses a MIG on the lower edge because he can make a more robust weld that he can later ground down to the radius he wants to achieve. When he needs to add a little pressure to hold the two pieces together, Phil will sometimes use the cup of his TIG torch pressed against the metal as he tacks it in place. It's a much more efficient solution than trying to grab one of the other guys away from their work to help out.
After putting a small tank roll on the inner edge, Phil uses his so-called Quidditch dolly to fine tune it even more. He decided to cut down his material one more time to dial in the fitment. With the metal shaped and tacked in place, Phil went ahead and fully welded out all the seams. You'll notice part of the bottom outer edge isn't yet welded to the fender. Phil will have to pull the fenders off at a later date to get the last section welded out. He moved on to grinding all the weld smooth. The grinding was a long process since he didn't want to remove more material than absolutely necessary. Phil uses the edge of a cutoff wheel to carefully shape the seam where the two pieces of metal meet. Then he uses a barrel sander on the inside of the headlight ring. The end result is 98% perfect. The only reason it's not 100% perfect is because there's still a flange in the inner fender so Phil doesn't have access to fully hammer out all the welds. But it's more than good enough to send off to bodywork and paint. Speaking of more than good enough, would you believe us if we told you that this was Phil's first time Frenching a set of headlights? And it's not like there was even someone sitting over his shoulder telling him what to do the whole time. Turns out a decade of dedication to metalworking is handy when it comes to learning something new.